Good afternoon. My name is Tim Pett. I am the director for the Center for Entrepreneurship in the Barton School of Business. On behalf of the faculty, staff, and students associated with the center, we want to welcome you this afternoon. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're in for a real treat this afternoon. Uh, our guest speaker is, uh, as you know, is Jeff Turner from Spirit Aero Systems, who has really taken a very uh, local company and made it a worldwide um, player in the aerospace industry. Um, it's a privilege to be here today to participate in the forum series. Uh, we launched the forum series about three years ago, and the purpose of the forum series was to provide an opportunity for our students, faculty, and the community to gain knowledge from the business experiences uh, from our forum participants. It also provides an interaction uh, with our successful business entrepreneurs and owners. And finally, it stimulates really interest and in business innovation, and I think that's what we're here for today, to talk about business innovation and creativity. Now I'd like to introduce the Dean of the Barton School of Business to introduce our keynote speaker today, Dean Hensler. Well, thank you very much. Um, this is a profound honor and a distinct privilege for me to introduce uh, Mr. Turner to you. Jeffrey L. Turner was named president and CEO of Spirit Aerosystems Incorporated in June of 2005 upon divestiture of the Boeing Commercial Airplanes Wichita Division. Prior to that, Mr. Turner served as vice president general manager of Boeing's Wichita Division since November of 1995. As Spirit Aerosystems CEO, he has successfully led the transition from Boeing Division to independent company, completing Spirit's initial public offering of shares in November of 2006. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Jeff Turner. Thank you, Dean. I hope while we're in here, my car is getting a ticket. I had to pay my fines to get my transcript to send it to Boeing so I could get a job. And uh, I've been trying ever since to get a ticket. <laughs> but now that it, they have nothing to hold over me, they won't give me a ticket, regardless of where I park. I haven't tried parking in the Dean's parking spot yet, but that might help. Um, it is a pleasure to be here today. If you'd have told me when I was a student here that I would come back as a... Uh, featured speaker, I, I probably would have argued with you and said no way on two accounts, no way I'd have anything to say and no way they'd ever invite me. But uh, I am extremely proud of Wichita State University. I, uh, I did uh, have the privilege years after I'd graduated here to be a student at, at MIT and I went to MIT scared to death because I looked at the roster of students who would be in my class in an executive MBA program, and they were from big name schools everywhere. And uh, I mean, Harvard and Princeton, and, and uh, there's a pretty big school in England, I forget the name of it, <laughs> but it was on there, and I mean, just people from, uh, from everywhere. And I thought, you know, how can a kid from Wichita compete? Um, so I was scared to death, but I got into the class, and and uh, worked hard and discovered w within just a few weeks that the education that I had received at uh, Wichita State University was not only probably the most economical education of anybody in the class, but it was equivalent to any education that any of my peers had received. And I was thoroughly and completely prepared to compete on the world stage. So when you tell people that you are a graduate of Wichita State University, you can rest assured that whether they recognize the university or not, that you have an equivalent capability to anybody in the world. Because we have a great university here that prepares us to, uh, to meet the challenges. It used to be the 20th century, and now, of course, the 21st century. Um, I want to acknowledge somebody else, a very important person to me, it wasn't till this morning, but Bill Wilson from the Eagle. Bill, are you in the room? Where are you? Right there. Bill published, and here, here's a feature. It says, Turner to be featured in Wichita State Forum. 
He put that on the web this morning, and our stock jumped 10% today. <laughs> so if you'll invite me, Dean, I'll be back every day for at least 30 days. It is a, it is a, a pleasure to be here. My, my task today is to talk about being innovative and creating creative within a, within a company. And uh, I do want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Pett and thank, thank you for the invitation and, and, and the preparation. I will try to address this subject. I know uh, those of you who are students here or have been are used to some, some great lectures with, with good content and, and good structure and, and uh, the ability for you to take something of value away. Uh, so I'm not going to try to duplicate that. What I'm going to do is try to just tell you the story of what we did at, at, at uh, Boeing, Wichita, to turn it into uh, Spirit Aerosystems. And maybe there's a few nuggets along the way. Um, and so I'll, I'll just start by talking about this whole idea of corporate entrepreneurship, of being innovative and being creative within a big company. Now, big companies, and Spirit is nowhere near as big as Boeing was or when we were part of Boeing, but Spirit is still a pretty good-sized company uh, with thousands of people and lots of processes and so on. Entrepreneurship tends to be thought of in much smaller segments. It tends to be thought of as a, as a Hewlett and a Packard in a garage building a new company or, or many of the software uh, people, of course, Bill Gates is the, probably the, the biggest example that people use, but <clears throat> I, I didn't innovate like that. I didn't come out of a, out of a, a new technology and a new a way of doing things. I came out of a big, giant company with a, with a bureaucracy. As I was preparing these remarks, I thought, you know, successful entrepreneurs develop bureaucracies in their companies or they die. Because entrepreneurial spirit alone, as companies grow and expand, can't manage, cannot manage big organizations. So the real challenge for companies is to, is to become bureaucracies. And I know bureaucracy is a really bad name and it's probably the antithesis of what you try to teach in the school of entrepreneurship. But the point is, as you grow and develop and expand, you have to be able to keep track of what's going on. The, the SEC requirements for financial reporting alone will sink a company if there isn't a financial bureaucracy that's efficient and effective and gets the job done. So big companies tend to become bureaucratic in nature. And the challenge is, how do you create a culture and a capability so that the fact that, it, that the organization is bureaucratic doesn't stifle the, uh, the creativity and the capability of the team? And that's a real challenge. So I'll talk a little bit about what we've tried to do to, uh, to nurture that kind of culture inside of, uh, of spirit. Another thought that I, that I wanted to leave with you is this whole idea of onto, being an entrepreneur within a big company. I think about it as creating an environment where there, are, there is freedom within a set of constraints. Now, I guarantee you that any entrepreneur that you want to talk about or think about that has been successful has done that within a set of constraints. Probably financial beyond anything else. But certainly within the constraints of the laws of, uh, of nature, the laws of the land, the laws of uh, thermodynamics, whatever. So, so constraints within a big company are a real and, and, and vital part of organization. And the real key is to create an environment where people are more focused on the freedom they have within those constraints and, frankly, the willingness to test those constraints. 
from time to time and, and be able to do that in a way that they, they don't focus on the constraints. They focus on the, uh, the freedom that they have within those constraints. And the unfortunate thing about big companies sometimes is they get so focused on the constraints that they force the entrepreneurial spirit of their team to figure out how to get their job done within those constraints. So that's one of the challenges that, that we face. You know, historically, we live in a city with, uh, with a real entrepreneurial spirit. For our particular industry, of course, the names that, that leap out are uh, Cessna, Beach, Learjet, Stearman, although most of us don't remember Stearman. It became Boeing in 1929. But I did not know this until I was preparing to give this talk, but 80 years ago there were nearly 200 licensed airplane builders in the area, and most of them failed. So hundreds, hundreds tried, and in our community three of the originals survived, and then a fourth came a little bit later with, uh, with Learjet. Why Wichita? I've, I've often thought, why, why Wichita? Why does Wichita have this incredible jewel of an industry? Um, I think, you know, clearly the entrepreneurial spirit's part of it. But from my perspective, we have a, we have a great workforce and a great work ethic. We had money when we needed it. And then, I think, timing. You know, you can be really smart and really capable. If your timing's off, you're off. And I think if you go back and look, the, the age, just like I have this theory that, that people like Stephen Jobs and, and uh, other people in, in that industry, if they'd have been born just five years later, they'd have been too late. You know, I, I joined Boeing in uh, a long time ago, 19... 19 <laughs> 1973, right after one of the biggest downturns in our industry, there were, the, the company we went down to 4,004 employees from 35,000 at the peak in the, in the B20, uh, in the B52 and B47 production days. And I joined the company right after the big dip. I was one of the first ones back in the door, part-time computer programmer. Somebody asked me a few years later, how in the world did you progress so fast through the company? When I hired in at that time, most of my coworkers were in their late 40s, early 50s. And the company then went through a period of time where they hired about 10,000 people in 10 years. If you could find your way to the bathroom, they'd put you in charge of something. <laughs> okay, so if I'd have been born five years later and I'd have joined that group in mass, you know, the opportunity wouldn't have been there. So I think there's a lot to do with when the opportunities present themselves and the timing and so on. I think Kansans are also adaptable. I mean, clearly these guys, Cessna and Beach and Learjet and so on, everything wasn't rosy, everything wasn't easy. They had to adapt. They had to adapt to funding. They had to adapt when the, when the war came along. And, of course, that was timing as well that helped a fledgling aircraft industry when thousands and thousands and thousands of airplanes were required. And, uh, and then I think there's some good fortune. Let me jump to why we did this. I think that's, a, that's an interesting uh, set of dynamics. I've been with the company, as was mentioned, over 30 years with Boeing. I had become the general manager of the division in 1999. A lot of things that occurred in, in our industry and in this town between the time of Clyde Cessna and Walter Beach and Lloyd Stearman and, and uh, 1995, the world had changed uh, dramatically. Companies that grew up were very highly vertically integrated. They do virtually their own parts build, their own design, their own parts building, their own assembly, and so on. The industry had shifted to where the OEMs in general were, uh, were focused on the customer, on designing new products in supporting products that were in the fleet and were, begin, were moving more and more to where they depended upon a, a partnership in the supply base for the design and build of components like the Wichita division of Boeing was designing and building. So we found ourselves with one customer in an environment where the world was moving 
to where all of our competitors could in fact design and build and deliver product for every other OEM on the globe and we in the Wichita division were a captive supplier, if you will, to one OEM, a very successful OEM, a very good OEM, and now a very, very good customer of ours. But nonetheless, one of, one of the marketplace. Our marketplace for our company increased 400% when we went independent. So just that one step allowed uh, opened up a whole bunch of new uh, a bunch of new markets for us. The the environment that we're in highly cyclical business, uh, um, frankly a maturing industry. You don't see a lot of entrants and a lot of exits in our business. Just a just a, a lot of mature companies doing a good. Job. Fortunately, a great and I and I maintain this is absolutely true today. A great underlying marketplace that is continuing to grow. Despite the current travails of the world economic situation, I think as soon as stability occurs and growth again, we will see growth in, the, in airline travel which is, or, or business jet travel, which is the underlying demand curve that, that drives our business. We will see it as it has for the last 75 years outstrip general economic growth in the world. So the, the, one of the wonderful things about our business is when somebody has a little extra money, they like to travel. And it doesn't matter what part of the globe they're in. They have family they want to visit. They have business they want to do. They want a vacation. They want to do all those things. So air travel, I believe, firmly is here and here to stay until we can beam me up, Scotty. <laughs> and... Last I checked, that's technology's a ways away. But so we're in a good underlying business, but it does cycle, and therefore it's very essential in my mind that we have that we have a, a strategy that is not an upside strategy and a downside strategy, but a long-term strategy that uh, that carries us through. I mentioned the competitive model was changing uh, more to key partners and less uh, vertical integration, and of course the global nature. Of our of our business, uh, so outsourcing was in, increasing, and here we were as an in-house supplier to one OEM. Uh, so part of the way that we came to the conclusion that we had to do something is we looked at this. How, how many have been out through our factory? I know a number of you have here. You, I I grew up kind of in the factory for 31 years and kind of got used to the idea. But I tell you, if you see it for the first time with new eyes, it is an awesome place. Wonderful world-class people in both in terms of design and manufacturing and tooling and, and uh, manufacturing engineers. We, we, have, uh, we have truly, in our workforce, in our management team, in our support staff, we have some of the world's very, very best at the kind of work that we do. And we had that, and, and frankly, my fear was if we didn't do something different strategically, that we would, in fact, see that capability dwindle away. And, uh, and, and part of the reason for that is that, as I mentioned, the OEMs were, were more and more focusing on customer, product, and product delivery and support, not the detailed design of the airplane parts themselves. And as we began to compete for positions on the 787 or on any other new airplane, as it's turned out now, the A350, um, Cessna airplanes and Gulfstream airplanes and Sikorsky helicopters. We, uh, we knew if we didn't do something with our business model that the constraints would keep us in a box that would eventually keep us from being successful. So we started pushing on the constraints and suggesting a number of business models to the corporation that we thought would, would help us use this great capability and create value. And ultimately, as you know, we, uh, we did do the divestiture. I, when people would ask, why are you doing this? And when I say people, oftentimes it'd be our own employees saying, why would we do this? We're kind of comfortable being part of Boeing. We've been part of Boeing for 80 years, 75, 80 years. Why would we change? When I look for, for the Wichita division in the Boeing strategy, 
I think of strategy like a bullseye. I didn't find what we did in the center, the bullseye of the strategy. We were important to them. We did good things for them. But we were kind of at the edge of the envelope instead of in, right in the heart of it. So I thought it'd be way better if we were in the heart of our own strategy than at the edge of somebody else's strategy. And so we, we went through a number of things. That we tried a number of things. We tried a wholly owned subsidiary approach. We looked at, uh, at some other approaches. And ultimately, ultimately, what occurred is what you know, and that is that, that the decision was made within Boeing and within what became Spirit to divest the company. I, I think it was one of the biggest win-win uh, certainly win-win strategies that I, certainly the biggest that I've ever been a part of. We, uh, we bought the company. We unleashed a great deal of value. We gave the parent company, when, when Boeing divested us, we gave them a substantial reduction in the price of goods and services that were coming out of our division uh, because we were able to restructure the cost to be market-driven. And, uh, and then, of course, we, in our, in our, uh, IPO and in a secondary and, and in, our, in our company today, we're still able to uh, create uh, value for the, for the future. One of the things we've done really, really aggressively is make sure that our team understands our basic strategy and our core operating values. Our basic strategy is long-term value creation. And I emphasize long-term. Because the products and services that we deliver are long-term products and long-term services. We are a, a key player on the wonderful new airplane, the 787. And that airplane, your grandkids will take their kids on vacation on 787 airplanes. And we, and we are putting in place in our factory the tools and methods and processes and designs that will deliver those products for decades. That is not a typical business model. You know, so if, if, I, if I speak with investors or I speak with people who, who want to know what are we going to do next quarter, I have a difficult time with that concept. Because the only way I can really affect next quarter is to either screw something up or get lucky. Because the fundamentals are of our business our long-term products, good, solid market leadership, and a continual, steady um, um, environment of innovation and improvement in our, with, our basic, uh, with our basic processes. So long-term value creation, be a partner of choice in the industry. And I think we've, uh, we've been able to show that that's what we are with uh, the success we've had with new customers. And then the values are really, really, really important to me. They're, they're values that, that I live by personally, and they're values that I expect everybody in spirit to live by. And it's being focused on a customer. It's being market-driven. As much as I would like to di dictate what the value of our products are, I cannot. The market will tell me what the value of spirits products are. The market tells us what the value of a workman's hour is, what, a, what an, an engineering, what, what her value is worth for an engineering hour. The market tells us what, uh, what pay and benefits are, are appropriate to the market, and we have to respond to that if we're going to be successful. So remember, we had moved out of an environment where we were a cost center, and we're now right on, that, right on the edge every day of you know, dollars in, dollars out, and managing that uh, much more closely. So being very attuned to the market was very important to us. A demand for excellence. Uh, we believe firmly, and I say this all the time, our team says it all the time, on a person-by-person -person basis, we have to be better than the competition. And Because uh, if we're not, the fact is there's a lot of people out there that would love to have these jobs in this business. I believe very firmly in dignity and respect for everybody. I think that drives the relationships that you have. I'm not talking about being overly nice. 
you know, frankly, one of, the, one of the challenges that big companies have is that sometimes they harbor poor performance. It is neither dignifying nor respectful to force a work group to have to work with, with a coworker who is not pulling their own weight. So dignity and respect is the way we treat each other and the way we act together. It, it, it's about uh, not being prejudicial against somebody for, for any reason other than performance. And it's, uh, it has to do with very much the interactions that we have with our, with our partners and with our customers and, uh, and with each other. And then, of course, the last value, the fifth value is teamwork, which, uh, which I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't know how any organization performs if they don't perform well as a team working effectively together. So those are the values we put in place to create the, the framework, if you will, if you will under which our team could have the freedom to do what everybody in every organization wants to do, and that is to be successful in the marketplace, do an excellent job of performance, and to see the rewards in a way that they can be, they can be shared. So in conclusion, I would tell you that I think we've been extremely lucky. I define luck as preparation plus opportunity plus perspiration. So without any of those, without the opportunity, we wouldn't have been able to be a successful company. But without preparing ourselves for it, and, and I could bore you with many details about the way we messaged the whole thing for a number of years to get ready for, we didn't know what, frankly, but we knew we had to move from, a, from a, a, an environment where people felt entitled to their jobs to an environment where people felt their job was to protect their company and to make their company successful. And uh, we, we spent a lot of time and a lot of energy messaging that when we were still part of Boeing before we even had a gleam that we would become a, we would become a spirit. And, um, and, of course, opportunity. Right time, right place is so important. You know, the book of Proverbs says there's a time for everything. And one of my favorites is, and I'm not even sure this is in there, but I say there's a time to buy and a time to sell. And then, of course, the whole idea of getting everybody on your team to ask a fundamental question. What if? What if we did this? What if we tried that? Because one day we were sitting around and we said, what if we were independent? What if we were our own company? And that was the seed that became a spirit. So thank you very much, and I'll be glad to try to answer your questions. <laughs>